Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Welcome all the worldwide audience, 249 nations of the world to watch the Manifest Telecast and so many people, not only in North America, but also through parts of Europe and the Middle East, all the way to Indonesia. Thank you for joining me. We're all, we are in Israel, in the northern part of Israel, and we're at a place which is called Caesarea Philippi. And it is the place that we read about in the Bible where it says that Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi and the revelation of him being the Son of God was pronounced here by Simon Peter. We're not going to get into so much the history of the particular site because we use these sites as backdrops for a particular type of teaching. I will tell you, however, that there was a great battle that took place here, a struggle in belief systems, a struggle between the belief of idol gods versus the true God, a, a struggle between idols that were set up on this hill and a living God that walked among the people who was Christ, who brought healing and deliverance to them. All the way back in the time of the New Testament, the Bible talks about spiritual warfare and spiritual struggles that the early church encountered. And for the next few moments, I'm going to be sharing with you a, a, a subject that I've never really got into detail with in 36 years of ministry called the Gumnutzia Factor, the Gumnutzia Factor. And uh, we're going to read one, one scripture that will become the foundational scripture of this teaching. It's found in 1 Timothy 4, 7, but, but refuse profane and old, old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, the word exercise here, the word used by the Apostle Paul is the word gymnasia, and it's where we get the word gymnasium from. Now, most of us in the United States know that a gymnasium is a place where men and women go and they work out. Sometimes we play basketball in a gym. Other times uh, they have sports events in a gym. We call it a gym, the abbreviated term. Um, we have today, instead of gyms, we have places like the YMCA where they do treadmills and they do weightlifting and swimming. However, in Paul's day, the gymnasium, as we would call it today, was a whole lot different than uh, what we know of today. As a matter of fact, it was actually a more a, of a meeting place, not just to exercise, not just to build your body up, but there was a lot of spas, there was a lot of hot rooms, and it was a place where men would meet together and they would discuss the social issues or the political issues of the day. So it was not just a place of working out, it was a place where discussions concerning the city were made, a place where all the men of the city could come together. Now having said that, I want to give you three definitions. First of all, there is a word used in the New Testament called godliness. Anybody, did anybody's mother ever say, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Remember that statement? Yeah. Everybody over 50 nodded their head. I guess it stopped at a certain age. People don't say that anymore. But uh, let me just say something. The word godliness is used in the New Testament, and that particular Greek word means to have respect for, to have reverence for, and really it has reference to holiness or separation. So when the Bible uses the word to be godly or have godliness, it means to separate yourself from the thinking or the mindset of car carnal ways or the things of the world. Now, among what we would term uh, Greek philosophy, among the Greek philosophers, if you were to say the word godliness, it had a little bit of a different definition. It meant to perform acts, actions appropriate to the gods. Actions, or in other words, act the way the God would want you to act. And so for us as Christians, that would mean to obey the word of the Lord, to obey what we have in the Bible. We have 66 books. We have what's called the first covenant. Some people call it the old covenant. We have the new testament or the new covenant uh, that was ratified uh, through the 27 books. And so it, means, it would mean to be be obedient to the Word of God. Now, in classical Greek, classical Greek, if you took the word God in this, here's what the meaning is. It means to behave according to your relationship to the God. In other words, if you want to behave according to the relationship you have with God, then you would, you would pray, you would give, you would give a finances, you would celebrate the feast that you were required to celebrate and to attend. So let me say this again. With Greek philosophers, it was to perform actions appropriate to the gods, but in classical Greek, it meant to behave according to your relationship to the God. Now, I'm going to say it this way. Godliness is your inner life, and religion is the outward demonstration of that life. Did everybody just get what I said? 
In other words, godliness is what happens on the inside. See, Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees as it relates to their godliness because everything was only outward. I mean, they had the phylacteries, they had the prayer shawls, they had the fringes of their garments enlarged. They fasted. They would put dark stuff under their eyes to make it look like they'd been up all night seeking God. And Jesus looked at them and got so upset at them because he realized something that he said, outwardly you look right, but inwardly you're just full of dead men's bones. So a lot of times people will perform an, perform an outward act of religion or an outward act of godliness, but inside it's what God looks at. Always remember this. You know, when I grew up in what we call a classical full gospel denomination, I hate to say this, but it's true, but a lot of the people judged people outwardly. They judged them by the hair length. They judged them by whether or not they had makeup on or whether or not they had jewelry on. And I'm being honest with you, these were good people that loved God, but they did a lot of outward judging. And sometimes they would look at someone outwardly, man, they look so holy and righteous, but they had a tongue so big you could wrap it around the telephone pole outside. They love to gossip. They love to cut down. They love to talk. They love to criticize. And so I would say this to you, that godliness is actually an inward act, an inward action that the Holy Spirit does in your life, separating you from the things of this world, giving you a desire to serve Him. And you begin to demonstrate that outwardly in your walk with Him. And people can begin to look at you. And it's not just like saying, she says she's a Christian. They will say, she really is a Christian. And they determine it by the actions of your life and your responses to the things that come to to you. Now, let me go a step further and talk to you about this being in a gym, the gymnasia, of the gym effect. You had to be over 18 years of age to participate in this, um, what we call the gyms back in the Greek day. Now, one of the things that was very, very, uh, very important if you were going to train is if you were going to train to be a wrestler, because wrestling was a really uh, uh, strong, um, how can I say this? It was uh, very prominent, and if you were a wrestler and you were good, I mean, they would give you a white stone. If you could win the Olympics with the white stone to the city that had your name on it, you got free bakery goods, free food. You could stay anywhere you wanted to stay. I mean, it was, it was a great blessing to a man who could become a wrestler and could beat his opponent and become the number one man. Now, the reason I'm pointing out about wrestling is because there were wrestling schools that existed back in the time when the, when the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians because in the book of Ephesians, and I have the verse here, chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in heavenly places. Now, here's what I want you to know about this idea of wrestling. In that day, when two people wrestled, they had to face one another. But here's how this was your goal. If I were to wrestle another man, my goal to, would be, and his goal would be, to get me on my back. First of all, please understand that. Get the opponent on the back. Now, the second thing he wanted to do was grab you right here right around the windpipe and start squeezing because the windpipe is a very, very sensitive part. And if you squeeze enough, you cut off the breathing of the person. And if you squeeze too hard, you can actually kill the person. So here's what they would do. They would get a hold of that person, get them on their back and start squeezing the windpipe until the opponent gave in. Now, in some instances, I want you to think about this. If the man gave in and didn't allow himself just to die in the match and the other guy win, if he gave in, then they would take the man that had lost. And what they would do is they would gouge out his eyes. Now, if you remember in the time of Samson, when the Philistines captured Samson and they took God's champion who had defeated so many Philistines and so many enemies, when they took him, what did they do to him? They gouged out his eyes and they put him grinding in a grind mill. And I've, I heard John Cahill, my friend, say this years ago, Samson was blind and bound and going round and round. One of the ways that you know if you are in a real bondage is the fact that you keep recycling the same thing. You keep praying to God, saying to God, God, I'm not going to do it again, but you do it again. And you go a couple days a week, and you do it again and again and again. It's called a repetitive sin. And so with Samson, he was blind. And once he was blind, he was so bound that he kept going around in circles over and over again. So the job of the enemy, if we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, please understand that the job of the enemy is to get you on your back where you can't get back up or to cause you to fall, maybe sports, uh, spiritually or morally, where you just can't get back up. And so you lay there and instead of getting up and fighting for your life and fighting for your soul and spirit, you lay there and you eventually just give up and quit. And that's what the enemy wants you to do is get into a battle of some kind. Doesn't matter if it's a battle in your home, your marriage, with your children, your job, your boss, your church, and then you just fall back on your back and say, here I am, take me captive. I'll give up and I quit. So this is the, the, the thing about it. You know, we talked about how 
I want just a second to go about how that in those particular days among the Greek wrestlers, that one of the things they would do is gouge out the eyes of their opponent once he gave up, once he quit. You know, the Bible tells us this in the New Testament. It says that Satan has blinded the minds and blinded the eyes of the people of this world. So there is no doubt a spiritual blindness that has been placed upon people in the day and time in which we're living in. Now let's go a step further because for a moment I want to give you the three were the three uh, keys of Roman wrestling. Three keys of Roman or Greek wrestling. And these are three keys that every wrestler had to do. Number one, you must always face your opponent. If you did not face your opponent in wrestling and you turned on your opponent, opponent you would get knocked down. You're going to get defeated the moment you turn. Now when Paul wrote about Ephesians 6 and 12 and he talks about the wrestling that believers have to do against the powers of darkness, he said this, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now that is uh, not a wrestling term. That is actually a Greek term for Roman soldiers or Roman, the Roman military, I should say. So in other words, if we were fighting in the Roman military, we never turned our back on the opponent or the enemy because they had spears and they had swords and daggers. And they, you, once you turn, your back, there's a little area in your back that could be open and you, would, you could be slain, killed, or, dead, or actually mortally wounded or wounded for life. So in other words, his statement to the believers was, once we have fought, once we have struggled against the principality, the power of the ruler of darkness and the wicked spirit, Keep standing, and, and this is what it actually means, and see if there's any more devils you can whip. <laughs> My spiritual mentor, T.L. Lowry, he'll get excited sometimes, and he's, he's a great man of God in his 80s now, and I, he used to preach, and he said, I feel so much of the anointing tonight. I could take one devil in this hand, one devil in this hand, and crack their skulls together. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that is actually what this means. Once you've defeated the enemy, keep defeating him. Now, let me, go, let me talk about number two. Ready? Number two is in a real wrestling match, you seldom had time to breathe, and so you had to go through what's called endurance training. What is endurance training? Everybody ready? It's a long trial that you have to go through, a long trial that you have to endure in order to develop the patience that you need in your life because the Bible said tribulation worketh patience. Trials bring experience in your life that really nothing else can. So here's, here's a point that I want to make. Uh, years ago, I played football. And one of the things I dreaded the most, I could put up with everything except wind sprints. The coach would get you on the 40-yard line, and you had to run nonstop to the goal line at that end. You had to stop. You had about three seconds, turn around and run 40 yards, three seconds, turn around and run 40 yards. And I'm telling you, you would do that about 10 times. And he would keep saying, you got to remember that when you're in the game, this is practice. And if you don't practice hard and the fourth quarter comes, you're going to be windy in the game. And you see, you see, there's one team, and I won't name the team. It's my wife's favorite favorite team, but there's a guy, there's a, <laughs> they all know who it is here, but there's a man, there's a man, and what he does, first quarter, he holds up four fingers, second quarter, four, fourth quarter, and in the fourth quarter, this guy is jumping, screaming, and if he walks up to a player on the sidelines, they've got, you know what that is? That means fourth quarter is our quarter. Doesn't matter what the score is, doesn't matter if we're behind or winning, we're going to take it in the fourth quarter. And one of the great coaches who was Paul Bear Bryant many years ago, some of the folks here will know who I'm talking about, but Paul Bear Bryant would work them so hard and the fourth quarter was the key because a lot of teams play hard in the first, second, and third quarter, but they get wore out and tired in the fourth quarter and they don't have the endurance. Now, I'm, I'm using that as an analogy to share with you that you've got, you know, we, you can come out of this gate running. You can come out and become a Christian and be strong. Man, I'm running for Jesus. Glory to God. I'm saved full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to do something for God. And you get halfway through your life and it's like this, I just don't know what happened to me. I just didn't make it, haven't made it, don't know what's going on, can't find God's will. And so you get toward that fourth quarter, which is the most important, because I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me carefully. It is not how fast you start the race. It's can you get across that finish line. That's what's going to count in the, in the life of every believer. Did you endure to the end? He that endures to the end, Jesus said the same shall be saved. Number three, you must train on how to get out of the holds that the enemy has put you in. There's offensive moves in every sport and there are defensive moves in every sport. An offensive move, it move is the hold that you put on the enemy so that you don't let him get away or you don't let him get away with what he's doing. You retaliate against the adversary. But the defense move is getting out of the hold that he has on you. The enemy has snares. The enemy has strongholds. And so what you have to understand is do what Paul said when he said, exercise yourself unto godliness. Now, I'm going to tell you something real funny here. In Greek, the word exercise yourself means to exercise naked. Now, don't stop. Let's stop right here. That don't mean to become a Christian streaker. That it has absolutely is not what it's talking about. But these were... 
these were all men, these were all men in gymnasiums, and they would actually wrestle, uh, wrestle new, to be honest with you, but what they would do is they, they would go into, and I've got, to, I've got to talk about this, a hot room, and number two, an oil room, and number two, they would train in the mud. I've got to get through this quickly because I want you to hear it. Number one, they put these men in hot, very, very hot steam rooms to cause them to sweat, so any impurities in their body would come out when the heat was on. What does that talk about? That talks about the trials of your faith. The Bible says the trials trials of your faith are much more precious than gold tried in the fire. So when you come under a fiery trial, what God is trying to do, everybody ready, is get the impurities out of you. Because here's the deal, if you don't get the impurities out of you now, down the road the impurities in you could cause destruction to you. So a lot of times God lets heat, and I'm talking to somebody, God lets heat and pressure come for the purpose of getting the junk out of you, okay? Number two, there were oil rooms. There were actually rooms that once the person got the impurities out, they would take them in and they would layer them day after day with oil. Now why did they layer them down with oil? Because what oil does, it, make the skin, it made the skin real slippery so that once they got in a match, you ready? for this, when the enemy tried to grab him, he would just slide right off. In other words, he couldn't hold the grip. Oh, I could go ahead and preach right here. In the Bible, you know what the oil represents. The oil always in the Bible has represented the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And what some of you need to understand is the devil is holding on to you too easy. He comes against you and he's got you and he's holding on to you. He's got you bound to the same old habits, same old rut, same old routine. But you know, Jesus made a statement in the garden. He said to the disciples, he said, Satan is coming, but he hath nothing in me. One of the translation puts it this way, Satan is coming but he don't have anything to hold on to. <laughs> so Jesus was a slippery Jesus. In other words, when the enemy tried to come against him and tried to hold on to him, the enemy would just slide right off. Some of you need to get oiled up. Come on, some of you need an oil change. You need to have a fresh anointing. David said, I'll be anointed with a fresh oil, and you need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit so that when the enemy comes, the anointing rises up in you. The power of God rises up in you. The resistance of God rises up in you. And the strength of God that he gives you to overcome the enemy rises up in you. You, all right. Number three, the third thing I want to tell you is about mud. Now, y'all ready for this? Can I tell you something? In, 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 in that particular time, they trained in the mud. They would get in the mud and they would train each other in the mud. Now, why are they training in the mud? Can anybody tell me? That don't even make sense spiritually. Oh, yes, it does. Are you ready? Because they knew that in warfare, it was not going to be this pretty little thing that you were going to do. If you go out into war and a soldier went out into war, they learned to train in the mud because soldiers are going to be muddy. Oh, you better hear me. And they, and they learned how to carry them when they were muddy and when they were slippery with mud on them. So they were trained in the mud to learn how to pick up guys and pick them up if they were wounded to carry them. And we're talking here specifically about Roman soldiers. Now you say, what on earth does that have to do? Everybody ready? I'm going to read the note I got here. In a real, in a real war, men get dusty, wet, muddy, sweaty, and stinky. When a man goes to a battlefield, he don't have time to take a shower. He may be in the same clothes for one or two weeks, depending on where the battle is. And so let me tell you something about Christian soldiers. Let me tell you something for a moment about those soldiers of the faith who fall by the wayside, Christian people who serve God, and they ha let something happen in their life, and they end up in the mud. And you know what most of us want to do? We want to say, well, he's just like a pig. He's a, he's a swine wallowing in the mire. He has gone back on God. Let him pick himself up. That is not what we're supposed to do. When we find a believer who's gotten muddy, and they've got and all messed up in the world. We're supposed to go in there and have the ability to pick up those old muddy folks, those individuals that have messed up and be able to pick them up. You ready? Here's what the soldiers did. Throw them over top your shoulder and say, you're not leaving church. You're not leaving the house of God. You're not leaving my life. You're not walking out on the Lord this way. I'm going to pick you up and carry you. I've told my young people, we have a lot of young people at OCI and Omega Center International, and uh, some of them have come out of some really, 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 really rough stuff. I'm talking about some major sins. And when I sit them down and get to know them, I said, there's one thing you need to know about Papa P. Now, they call my wife Mama P, Mama Pam. My name is Perry. They call me Papa P. It's not disrespectful. That's just how the, they do it. And I said, there's one thing you need to under understand. I am not letting you backslide. I'm not letting you that you drunk find you in a bar. I said, if I go in a restaurant and find you at a bar, I'm walking up in the bar and I'm saying, what are you doing here? And I'm going to pick you up and make you go out the parking lot from that bar. You know why? Because when all when believers get in the mud, and sometimes they do, we're not supposed to sit back and just say, well, I just can't believe they're acting that way. Can you believe they fall like that? Lord, I thought they were a good Christian. Go out there and get them out of the pig pen. Go out there and pull them up out of the mar and do what the Roman soldiers used to do and throw them, throw them symbolically in a metaphor, throw them over top of your shoulder and carry them back into the... That's good preaching. I wish somebody would uh, help me out here just a little bit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now... 
I don't have time to cover all this, but I want to share something with you. There's four guidelines I want to give you very quickly. Guideline number one, and these are gamnazo guidelines, okay? Exercising yourself to godliness. If you didn't miss the tele, if you've just got in on the tail end of the telecast, you missed the best part, but I want to leave this with you. Number one, the greatest lesson you ever learn is to learn your lesson the first time. Meaning, once you've made a mistake, once you've made an error, do not go back and make the same mistake over again. Number one. Number two, don't wait until the battle before you put on your armor. So many people do not keep the armor of God on only when they're getting into a major conflict that's about to mess them up till they go and they put on the armor of God. Everybody got that one? Don't wait till the battle before you put on the armor. You've got to keep your armor on daily. Number three, don't let your disadvantage become the enemy's advantage. Because can I tell you something? The enemy already knows your weakness. You don't have to expose to the enemy what your weakness is. If, you're, if, if it's gossip, if it's fear, if it's, if it's a strife, if it's contention, if you're kind of person that is, it, it has difficulty forgiving, the enemy already knows what your weakness is. Do not let that weakness become his advantage. Deal with, don't, don't, be, don't keep emphasizing your strengths. Deal with your weaknesses. That's where he's going to come in, not where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. Number four, don't ass- oh, you better listen to this. Don't assume your adversary plays by the rules. And this is the biggest mistake we make as believers because we play by guidelines, we play by rules, but our enemy does not play by the rules. He's wicked, he's vicious, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and you need to have that knowledge and have that understanding. And ladies and gentlemen, it's right here where I'm standing, somewhere in this area where Jesus came and said, who do men say that I am? They said, you're the son of God. And Jesus said, on this rock that I'm the son of God, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The reason we're victorious is because we serve a victorious Savior who's conquered death, hell, and the grave and given us the authority over all the powers of the enemy. I'll be back in just a moment uh, just so that you'll know I've written a brand new book. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited about this. I do have a chapter on this subject in the book. I want you to read in detail. And I'll be right back in just a moment. And I've got some very special announcements to make. Everybody, let's give the Lord a hand. All right. Believers that have served Christ for many years are suddenly hitting spiritual roadblocks, heavens that seem like they're made of brass, and many other hindrances they have never before encountered. With his time running short, Satan is releasing new levels of temptation and bizarre spiritual warfare in believers' families, churches, and thought life. How is the enemy sneaking through the protective hedge of armor causing distractions and defeat? All Satan needs is just a crack in any part of your six-piece armor to slip into a situation and initiate aggressive warfare. Perry Stone's new book, There is a Crack in Your Armor, is a timely read for all believers. Revelation from God's Word, along with Perry's insight from 36 years of ministry and over 80,000 hours of Bible study merge in this book to bring you a true manifesto on the inside strategies of the adversary and the methods of dealing with strange spiritual conflicts. Key subjects in this book include inheriting your ancestors' demons, winning battles in public but losing battles in private, breaking the spirits of cutting and suicide, the danger of falling upon your own sword, how to mend the cracks in broken vessels, it's not the devil, it's you and reversing a self-curse, what happens when an offense puts a crack in your shield, getting back your mind when you are at wit's end. Seven common factors that will wear down your spiritual strength. This book is part of package offer ARM 112. Along with this new book, Perry is offering the DVD teaching, Blood Moons Rising and the Passover Patterns. Perry began disclosing the significance of blood moons back in 1996 during Jerusalem's 3000th anniversary. There's much clamor concerning interpreting these cosmic prodigies. After much Hebraic research, Perry saw two important prophecies that must occur if these lunar eclipses are truly the signs mentioned by the prophet Joel. Recorded live, this teaching will explain how God uses cosmic signs and the two events other teachers have missed that must accompany these blood moons over the course of the next 15 months for this to be part of the prediction in Joel chapter two. Perry's new landmark book, There is a Crack in Your Armor, and the latest prophetic DVD, Blood Moons Rising and the Passover Patterns, are available now for a donation of just $30 or more. Call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 
212-7323 or order online at perrystone.org. You may also send your donation of $30 or more to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Request offer ARM 112 when writing or calling. The book and DVD package are available only through the ministry of Perry Stone, and your donation helps keep Manifest on in your area. We look forward to hearing from you soon. If you want to know how to deal with spiritual warfare that you're going through, weird warfare, testing and temptations, and if you like to know what about this prophetic signs in the heavens, and are we really in a cycle that's a last day cycle, or is it just another cycle of these lunar eclipses that call blood moons everybody's talking about? This is the, this is the offer that you'll want to get. There's a crack in your armor, and also blood moons rising and the Passover patterns. This is this week's offer on the Manifest Telecast. I want you to get both of these from our ministry because you'll help keep Manifest on the air when you do that. Uh, I, I just want to tell you that um, the, the Holy Spirit has really been uh, sharing with us some things that are very, very important. Most of you who are partners of our ministry know that we have our partners homecoming coming up uh, starting June 24th for five days, nine services here at OCI. And I want to talk to you for a moment and just mention that if you would like to be a partner of our ministry, there's a lot of benefits. Number one, you get to be invited on the partners only tour, a private tour with me with about 100 partners. And number two, you also uh, uh, are invited to come to the partners homecoming. So those are two benefits of partners. They get to go on a special Holy Land tour that's separate from the main tour, and they get to attend a partners conference where they meet Pam and I, we sign books there, we take pictures, we hang out at the ranch together with our partners, we pray for them personally, we have a great time in the Lord. So contact our ministry if you'd like to be a partner, and you can still get in on the June Partners Conference. But let me tell you some things we're going to be, uh, places we're going to be coming to. On June the 5th, which is a Thursday night, Metro Church of God, Birmingham, Alabama, to the Church of God camp meeting. Then, Friday Friday through Sunday, June the 6th through the 8th, is Redemption Church International there in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, last time we were there, the church was packed with men and women. We're looking forward to having a great time in the Lord there again. Then Tuesday and Wednesday, the Texas Church of God State Camp Meeting in Weatherford, Texas, and that'll be June 10th and 11th. On June the 13th through the 15th, which is a Friday through Sunday, Agape Church, Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's going to be a great conference as well. Then the Partners Conference will be June 24th through the 28th, and then Sunday afternoon, I think it's a two o'clock service at Rod Parsley's church there in Columbus, Ohio on July the 6th. So let me say again, go to parrotstone.org. Now when you go there, if you will look on the left side of the screen, there's something called the Stone Report. It's an 11 minute video clip that I want to show you. Take some time, go there and listen to it because we've got some information that we want to be able to share with you. And once again, I want to thank all of our partners, our monthly tape partners, our, our partner strike force partners, our dollar a day partners, because you help us pay for it. It's a total of about $5 million of television airtime every year by helping support the ministry and by helping keep Manifest on the air in 249 nations of the world. And we're so grateful for your support. And again, become a partner of our ministry and get in on some of these great benefits. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2014 Israel tour. The dates are November 24th through December 3rd. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.